Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. The election approaches. The head of the U.S. Catholic Bishops Pro-Life Committee joins us to remind voters of the importance of protecting the unborn. Where they stand, a look at how both presidential candidates would approach the abortion issue if elected. We talk to our pro-life panel. And we speak with a young mother who chose life for her son. Her fight now to influence voters on a pro-life proposition in her state. We are just days away from the 2020 U.S. presidential election. With Amy Coney Barrett sworn into the Supreme Court this week and the U.S. presidential election pending, the abortion issue is at the forefront of national conversation right now. A new EWTN News Real Clear Opinion Research poll found Catholic voters are less likely to support candidates who support taxpayer funding of abortion or who support abortion at any time during a pregnancy. In order to better guide Catholic voters, U.S. Catholic bishops last November approved a letter supplementing their voting document. The word preeminent is now included ahead of abortion to accurately reflect the church's teaching in prioritizing innocent life. Joining us now to discuss the church's teaching on life is Archbishop Joseph Nauman, the chairman of the U.S. Bishops Pro-Life Committee. Your Excellency, welcome back. Can you clarify church teaching on human life and dignity and how the threat of abortion is prioritized? Thanks, Catherine. It's a, a privilege and a joy to be with you, with your viewers and listeners. We, as the bishops of the United States, as you mentioned, identified abortion and euthanasia, but primarily abor abortion as the preeminent issue. And by preeminent, we're saying it's the most important issue. And we explain why that is. First of all, because abortion attacks life when it's most vulnerable, when it's most, it's least able to defend itself. Secondly, that it happens within the family. And it not only destroys the life of the child, but it scars the mother and father. And then the sheer numbers of abortion that in the last year that we have data for, over 800,000 American children were killed that year. And each of those children had a mother and a father that were mm -hmm. scarred. So for these reasons, we, we see it as an issue unlike any other. There are many important issues that we care about as Catholics, many that we consider, but there's none that rise to this level of importance as the abortion issue and the protecting of the unborn and protecting their parents as well. Mm. You met with Pope Francis in January of this year and told him that U.S. bishops have been criticized by some for identifying the protection of the unborn as the preeminent priority. How did the Holy Father respond? Well, he, he first said, why, why? And I said, well, I think they objected to the word preeminent. And he, he said, well, of course it's preeminent. Without life, no other rights matter. And so he acknowledged the, the accuracy of what the American bishops had done and was supportive of our use of that term. Mm. Your Excellency, we are seeing a number of Catholic politicians at all levels invoke their faith on the campaign trail, but advance a pro-abortion agenda. How should the church handle this situation? Well, I think as you describe it, that's particularly problematic for a couple of reasons. First of all, as bishops, we have to be concerned about the politicians and their own, um, the, the state of their own souls. So we have to have conversations with them. We have to make sure they understand the issue and the seriousness, the moral gravity of what they're supporting. But when they identify themselves as Catholics and then go on to say they support legalized abortion, that creates another problem because now they're creating scandal. They're misleading others to believe that, well, I'm a good Catholic uh, and I'm doing this so you can support abortion as well. And so we have to, we also have an obligation to protect our people from scandal. 
So it, we have to have these conversations. In some cases, I've had instances in the state of Kansas where I've had to ask Catholic politicians not to present themselves for communion because it was a matter of scandal for our people. Mm. Your Excellency, 2020 has been a highly contentious year from how to protect lives during the coronavirus pandemic mm -hmm. to a national discussion on race and racism and seeing the dignity of every human life. How do we weigh these important issues of human dignity? Yeah, so I think racism is a, a, another issue that involves intrinsic evil mm -hmm. where we like the abortion issue in that sense. Um, and really, I think in the pro-life movement, we want to get to the place where I think our culture and society is in terms of racism. No one can support racism today and not be criticized from every side. And that's what we want to achieve with the abortion issue as well, this consensus that it's not one party's issue, but it's a consensus of all Americans that we can never allow the destruction of innocent life, just as we can never allow uh, for people to be discriminated against because of their race or ethnicity. Absolutely. Uh, we are just days away now from Election Day, and it is every Catholic voter's responsibility to inform and form their conscience on the issue of life ahead of Election Day. Your Excellency, what resources would you suggest for this? Yes, you can go to respectlife.com. Dot org uh, and slash there's an article there on priorities for voting uh, that I authored to help Catholics with this. And you know, I think uh, there are many issues that we care about, but we can disagree. Um, Catholics can disagree on how we go about some of these issues, like what's the best policy to help the poor? What are the best policies uh, to welcome immigrants? Even like the COVID-19 virus, we can disagree on how the, what's the best approach there. But on the abortion issue, we can't really disagree. Um, there, there's never a moral justification for the taking of an innocent human life. And so I think we need to be focused on that and uh, to evaluate candidates on that primary issue, that preeminent issue and then look at what their policies are on other issues as well. Mm. Finally, Your Excellency, as we near Election Day, we are hitting peak political tension. As a pastor and shepherd, can you share a word with our viewers about how to stay holy during this divisive time? <laughs> well, I think the most important way is that we stay close to the Lord. And we realize this election's gonna be over with, uh, and elections are important but they're not what we stake our hope in. Our hope is, and our trust is, that the Lord is with us, no matter what these election results may have, no matter how good or how bad we might think they are, we should never lose sight that um, the Lord is with us and he's not gonna abandon us and he will help us no matter what the results of this election. And we need to remain faithful, not just in our voting, but there are other ways that we can defend life today as well. And, uh, the Bishops' Conference has started this initiative, uh, Walking with Moms in Need. So how can we create more resources mm -hmm. so no woman thinks that her best choice is abortion? So however the election turns out, we have to keep our, our pro-life efforts going. Absolutely. Archbishop Joseph Nauman, Chair of the U.S. Bishops' Pro-Life Committee, thank you for your leadership and for your time. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks for the important work that you do. U.S. presidential nominees Donald Trump and Joe Biden are promising dramatically different abortion-related policy goals if elected president next week. In a letter to pro-life leaders last month, President Trump said if re-elected, he will continue the transformation of the federal judiciary with judges who do not legislate an abortion agenda from the bench overcome the Democratic filibuster in Congress to pass pro-life laws like the pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act and the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act. Trump also promised to fully defund the big abortion industry, such as Planned Parenthood, of our tax dollars. Meanwhile, on the campaign trail, Democratic nominee Joe Biden 
has vowed to codify Roe v. Wade, restore federal funding for Planned Parenthood, restore the Affordable Care Act's contraception mandate, and rescind the Mexico City policy, which stops U.S. taxpayer funding of the abortion industry overseas. To put all of this into perspective and to answer abortion-related campaign questions, we're joined now by our pro-life panel via Skype. Marjorie Dannenfelser is president of the Susan B. Anthony List and co-chair of Pro-Life Voices for Trump. Dr. Christina Francis is a board-certified OBGYN and chair of the board of the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Thank you both for being here. Dr. Francis, we'd like you to start to clear up misconceptions about abortion on the campaign trail and specifically late-term abortion. During the one and only vice presidential debate, Vice President Mike Pence said, quote, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris support taxpayer funding of abortion all the way up to the moment of birth, late-term abortion. The Washington Post fact checker responded with this, neither Biden nor Harris supports late-term abortion and infanticide. They do not support funding abortion up to the moment of birth. Dr. Francis, media outlets also frequently say late-term abortion is not a medical term. As a medical doctor, what is meant by late-term abortion and how common are these procedures? Well, you know, absolutely in this election year, as in many other election years, the issue of abortion has become highly politicized. Um, but women's lives and the lives of preborn children, they really deserve more than these word games that people are trying to play. You know, um, as medical professionals, we use the term heart attack all the time, yet that's not a medical term. It's a term that we use so lay people can understand when we're talking about myocardial infarctions. Mm -hmm. uh, the phrase late-term abortion is very similar. Um, it in and of itself is not a medical term. However, it describes what is happening. So typically this is referring to abortions that happen at about 20 to 21 weeks or later in pregnancy. And while these don't uh, com comprise the bulk of abortions that happen in this country, it does comprise about one to 2% of abortions that happen here. And so when you look at um, the number of abortions that happen in this country every year, that is still a very significant number of children who are killed through abortion, um, either around or after the point of viability where they could survive outside of their mothers. Mm. Marjorie, can you clarify where the Biden-Harris ticket stands on abortion? Your group also frequently states they support late-term abortion. That's right. They do. Up until birth, both of them have been on record voting against everything that would prevent this. Every single opportunity they, opportunity that both of them have had in the Senate, they have, they have voted down. They have been the reason that we could not get even a 20-week bill passed in the United States Senate. It's such a modest and compassionate thing. They both also believe that uh, that the uh, court should continue to affirm Roe versus Wade, which would prevent states from having any other position uh, than that than their particular position. Uh, the consequence of this election is tremendous. That you could not have a two more different um, sets of opinions than on the Biden ticket and the Trump uh, presidency. They just couldn't be more different. Um, and, uh, and and there is no question that they will follow through on every promise that they have made to uh, to have taxpayer funding of abortion up until birth. It's just what they believe. They believe that it's health care. They don't see any reason why you would do it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Francis, on this subject of late-term abortion, can you explain what happens if a pregnant woman's life is in danger? Is abortion ever necessary in that situation? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. You know, at APLOG, we um, stand for women receiving all of the information that we have at our fingertips. And unfortunately, I think this is something that is used to scare um, not only women, but voters as well into um, supporting abortion. And um, there absolutely are heartbreaking times when women are facing life-threatening complications of their pregnancies. However, if this happens beyond the point of viability, there is absolutely zero reason why an abortion would need to be done. You simply deliver the patient and you take care of baby and you take care of mom. Um, in those very rare circumstances where they happen prior to the point of viability, uh, which I have been a part of, then sometimes we do need to recommend a premature delivery for the mother in order to save her life. You know, I can think of 
many times that I've sat at a patient's bedside and discussed this with them and cried with the woman and her her significant other as we talk about the fact that um, that she is experiencing this complication and so we do need to do an early delivery. However, that is not an elective abortion. And in fact, it can be done in a way that um, preserves the dignity of that, that preborn child so that the parents can hold that child and grieve over the child. Um, but especially when we're talking about pregnancies that are at you know, 21, 22 weeks and beyond, where that baby can survive outside of mom, then absolutely, as physicians, our responsibility is to take care of both of those patients. And so we can do that by delivering mom and giving baby excellent health care, as well as giving mom that excellent health care. Mm-hmm. You know, medical advancements in the last even five years have become so significant that now we can talk about babies being born at 22 weeks and potentially surviving. Marjorie, President Trump in 2016 campaigned on defunding Planned Parenthood. He's campaigning on that promise again this year, but recent annual reports reveal that federal funding to Planned Parenthood increased under his administration. Can you react to that news, and what is your message to pro-lifers who don't trust Trump will follow through on pro-life promises? Well, he's absolutely already followed through to the extent that the executive branch can allow him in every single way that he could. Uh, with the support of pro-life people and pro-life and, and pro-life America, he's, he has cut funding, $60 million worth through the Title X program, which is a small portion of the overall Medicaid-dominated uh, funding of, of Planned Parenthood. Um, he's also cut off funding in a far more direct dramatic way internationally, exporting abortions through our funding of organizations who um, counsel and uh, and further abortions in, na- in foreign nations. You know, there there is a robust debate about what the executive branch should be doing and what should be doing, but we must acknowledge that there are limits in what an executive order can and can't accomplish. Um, we had Susan B. Anthony List of looking at different ways to handle that, and it's just been tough. Mm-hmm. Um, this president is the most pro-life president operationally in history. Hands down, I've been involved in policy here on Capitol Hill and beyond for decades. And he has operated as the most pro-life president in history. He's opposing, of course, the most pro-abortion ticket in history. Never been a moment of greater contrast and a moment of such import when, they're judge- when the judges on the Supreme Court and other federal courts are looking at possibly allowing states to start to limit abortion. And to have that rug pulled out from under us right now would just be a tragedy for millions and generations of children to come. Mm. Well, I wish I could speak to you both more at length, but that wraps our conversation for this week. Thank you so much, Marjorie Danen Felser and Dr. Christina Francis. Thank you. Thank you. The sanctity of human life is central to the teachings of the Catholic Church. We believe every human life begins at the moment of conception and lasts until natural death. That's a fundamental belief we as Catholics carry with us from inside our church walls to outside in the public square. And now that we are only days away from election day, we need to make sure we are first and foremost informing our conscience on this issue of life. We should be rereading the catechism, papal encyclicals on life, and even reviewing EWTN's Voter's Guide. That way, when we get to the ballot box, we can make a well-informed and prayerful decision. And that brings us to this week's Call to Action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and sign our pledge that you will vote pro-life. By signing this pledge, we can keep each other accountable to prioritize life at the ballot box. Let us all commit to informing our conscience, praying, and discerning our decision for our election day vote. How crucial it is to have lawmakers and national leaders who respect the dignity of all human life. Life is sacred and a fundamental right. Again, as we prepare for election day, sign the pledge that you'll vote with life in mind. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Coming up, we'll talk to a young mother working to end late-term abortion in her state. And Amy Coney Barrett has been sworn in as our newest Supreme Court justice, but opponents are still making alarmist claims about her. We'll call them out and set the record straight.
Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. The abortion lobby is up in arms over Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation to the Supreme Court. That is this week's Speak Out segment. Ever since President Trump nominated Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court, the abortion lobby and some media outlets have been spreading lies and half-truths about the Catholic mother of seven in order to stir up fear and hysteria. Now that she's been confirmed this week, that hysteria is reaching peak levels. There are many examples to choose from. Here are a few. Abortion lobby NARAL tweeted, There's no mystery here. Amy Coney Barrett is a threat to reproductive freedom. Anyone who pretends otherwise is either willfully ignorant or intentionally gaslighting. Some media outlets also started pushing this dangerous narrative. The Cut, a style magazine, literally started a fundraising campaign for abortion groups. The Cut tweeting out, alarmed by Amy Coney Barrett's abortion views, if you can, donate to an abortion fund. It then included a link to donate. Fashion magazine Vanity Fair published an article with this headline, Amy Coney Barrett, about to be confirmed to the Supreme Court, sees a scenario in which abortion should be punishable by death. And here's an op-ed that ran in NBC News the day of her confirmation titled, Amy Coney Barrett's Supreme Court Confirmation Jeopardizes More Than Abortion. No reputable pro-life advocate calls for women who undergo abortions to be punished and imprisoned. And this notion that Amy Coney Barrett is a threat to women is laughable. Need I remind the abortion lobby that Amy Coney Barrett is a woman, and as a mother of seven, I'm sure she knows the importance of women's health. Pro-lifers celebrate that Barrett is a constitutionalist who respects the constitutional right to life. But abortion advocates depict her as a woman walking into the Supreme Court chambers with some devious agenda to create a dystopian reality. But the abortion lobby and abortion advocates are not interested in sharing truth, not on the life issue, and not about our newest Supreme Court justice. It's important to remember that instilling fear and frenzy is not of the Lord. So let us in the pro-life movement continue to walk in truth and in peace. As we near election day, there's a lot more at stake than who lives in the White House the next four years. For example, in Colorado, voters will either give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to Proposition 115. The ballot initiative would ban all abortions after 22 weeks, except when a woman's life is directly threatened by pregnancy complications. The ban would not make an exception for cases of rape, fetal abnormalities, or a woman's mental health. Proponents are particularly focused on Colorado because it is one of just seven states that has no restrictions on late-term abortions. Joining us now via Skype is Lauren Castillo, a Colorado mother whose pro-life beliefs were tested when she had an unplanned pregnancy seven years ago. She is a strong advocate for Proposition 115 and is urging Colorado residents to vote yes. Welcome, Lauren. First, tell us briefly about your choice for life when your son was born seven years ago. It was a challenging situation, I understand. Yes, it's a joy to be with you. Um, yeah, seven years ago, I mean, really, my pro-life beliefs were put in front of me, where I had the the decision to, you know, walk the talk. I had always grown up pro-life and I always grown up Catholic, and you know, it was the first time in my life where really my relationship with God was was put to the test. And at a small Catholic university um, is a Jesuit Catholic school in Denver, Colorado, and I was due on graduation day. And so it was, you know, a challenge um, to say the least. I was double majoring and was doing an honors thesis actually on spiritual warfare and exorcism, which I feel like the Lord was preparing me going to work full time into the pro-life movement after graduation. And so I was pregnant and my due date was graduation day, but my son was born about five and a half weeks early. And so I was you know, managing, just finishing school in addition to, I had an internship where I was working um, part-time throughout the week. And then when my son was born prematurely, you know, not only did I, um, I was doing homework while I was in labor at the hospital, I delivered on a Thursday and was back to school that next week. And um, so not only was it difficult to fit in chairs while I was pregnant, but, you know, managing 
to be a parenting mm -hmm. student um, to finish out my senior year was difficult as well. Wow, Lauren, you are a super mom. And I understand Colorado is one of seven states that allows late-term abortion with no limits. What are you saying to voters to convince them to support Proposition 115? Yeah, that's right. We are trying to pass Proposition 115, and I've been out there door knocking on hundreds of doors, you know, this past weekend and the weekend before that, having conversations with local voters. And people are pretty shocked when they find out that we have no restrictions on abortion in Colorado. And when I tell them that we're only one of seven states, but in addition, we have the same lack of um, regulation that North Korea and China do, who are notorious human rights violators. And people are pretty shocked about that, and they want to support Proposition 115. We have a battle in front of us here in the state. You know, we were the first state to decriminalize abortion before Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton. So it hits home in a particularly strong way here in Colorado. But, you know, being a native of Colorado, being involved in a pro-life movement for more than a decade here locally and nationally, um, it's something that I've seen bring the movement together in a way that I haven't seen before in our state. And so there's been so many beautiful things for the pro-life community here who we've come together across denominations and churches and communities mm -hmm. to say, yes, we believe that this is too extreme to allow abortions till the day of birth in our state. And we want to protect mothers and their babies here. And our state can do better to protect them by placing common sense limits on abortion after 22 weeks. Finally, Lauren, can you just give a quick message to other mothers who might be watching who might be tempted by thoughts of abortion? Yes, you can do it. There are so many resources in our community that is that are there to support you and walk this journey with you because you're not alone. And I know it firsthand because the pro-life community reached out to me with open arms when I faced my unplanned pregnancy and I delivered prematurely as they were right by my side, you know, supporting me trying to figure out how you get on health insurance, how you're going to support, um, you know, a baby and finish school and, you know, grow as a family and be able to um, pursue the career of your dreams. And that's what I've done is I've pursued the career of my dreams, mm. serving with students for life for the past yeah. seven years. And there's just so many resources. You don't have to do it alone. Just reach out to your local, you know, diocese, your local church, and we're here to help. Beautiful. Thank you, Lauren Castillo, for sharing your witness. God bless you. God bless. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.